Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Neve McCarthy, a senior ESG analyst at Climate Advisors and a part of the Chain Reaction Research Consortium. So today we'll be discussing the findings of two new reports from Chain Reaction Research and also from the Zoological Society of London SPOT initiative. So both reports reviewed the state of deforestation commitments amongst the crushers and refiners in the palm oil industry. So why is this important? Well, these palm processors act as a key bottleneck in the industry, and they serve a vital function for implementing sustainability efforts due to their significant leverage within the industry. So today we have Chris Wiggs here to talk to you about the Chain Reaction Research Report, and Annabelle Dodson from the Zoological Society of London SPOT team. We're also fortunate today to be joined by Nina Roth, from BMO Global Asset Management to give us a financial perspective when it comes to sustainability commitments. And Eleanor Spencer will be uh, answering questions from the Zoological Society of London team as well. So let's start with some housekeeping and a brief overview of today's webinar. So you can see our lineup of speakers on the left-hand side of the page. And please also note that all attendee microphones will be muted during the webinar. We do invite you to submit questions throughout the presentation, however, using the Q&A option in your Zoom control panel. So we'll try to get through as many questions as we can within the time. Finally, a recording of this webinar will be made available by email to all registrants within the next couple of days. And also remember that you can find past recordings of webinars on the events page of the Chain Reaction Research website. So let's begin the discussion now with Chris Wiggs of Aid Environment, a key Thanks. member of the Chain Reaction Research Consortium and lead developer of the first report on our agenda today. So thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Uh, I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit about the report and also about Chain Reaction Research itself. Yeah, thanks, Neve. Hello, everyone. Yep, um, so today I'm going to be talking about our report, which looked at um, NDP policies um, in the refining sector in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and it was titled NDP policies cover 83% of palm oil refineries, implementation at 78%. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, as Neve said, um, I work for Aid Environment and we're part of the Chain Reaction Research Consortium along with Climate Advisors and Profundo, and the report I'm talking about today was published as part of this um, research consortium. Next slide. So just a little bit of context about sort of why we decided to look into the, the trading and refining sector. Um, the palm oil industry has um, transformed quite significantly in the last few years with the adoption of um, sustainability policies known as no deforestation, um, no peat, no exploitation policies, or NDPE. And they were predominantly adopted by the um, midstream sector of the industry, the traders and refiners. And that was key. Um, and the palm oil industry was sort of um, perfect for the adoption of these policies by that midstream sector because of the way it functions. You have thousands of growers, you've got thousands of manufacturers and consumer goods companies, but comparatively few traders and refiners in the middle. So if you can sort of target that middle section, which is handling um, you know, the bulk of the palm oil that's coming, you can affect real change. Um, so that's why we looked at the trading refining sector. Uh, next slide. Um, we decided to look at it in Indonesia and Malaysia because um, around half of the world's refineries are based in those two countries. And they're obviously the largest producers of palm oil as well. Um, and for this analysis, we looked specifically at the refiners that are refining or trading CPO. We didn't look at the kernel crushes. Um, so it differs slightly to the report that ZSL will discuss with you a little bit later. So we looked at this section um, because half of the world's refineries are there, but also because the companies that have adopted policies are often have refineries in Indonesia and Malaysia. So there's a lot of transparency. There's a lot of accurate data you can get for Indonesia and Malaysia about capacity, about ownership that you can't get in other countries. So it's quite a good um, sort of region to use as a case study. So we looked at um, 
all 155 refineries in Indonesia and Malaysia, 88 in Indonesia, 67 in Malaysia, which are owned by 78 different companies. We looked to see if they had NDP policies first, which would give us a figure of how much of refining capacity was covered by NDP policies. And then to look at implementation, we had two key indicators. One was, do they have a public supply list? Because a public supply list will show who they're buying from. Um, and do they have a public grievance list? Because the grievance list will show, are they doing any work to um, implement their policies to their third party suppliers to ensure that not only are their own holdings um, compliant with these policies, but the people they're buying from are compliant. And by doing this analysis, we were able to get figures for the percentage of refining capacity in these two countries covered by these policies. Next slide. Our analysis showed that NDP policies cover 83% of the refining capacity in Indonesia and Malaysia. We had done a similar analysis in 2017, and we saw that there had been a 9% increase in coverage since then. And that um, increase had come only from six refining companies in the region adopting policies. Because they're so significant, the capacity that they refine is so significant, just six companies adopting a policy had seen um, you know, 9% increase which is quite significant. And when you look at um, you know, that figure, it is quite impressive. It shows you that the majority, you know, the overwhelming majority of refiners and the refining capacity in these two key regions of Southeast Asia are covered by policies that commit them to no deforestation and no peat conversion in their supply chains. Next slide. When you look at um, implementation, it does fall slightly. Um, it goes down to 78%, which again is still a high figure, but it shows you one of the biggest issues that is um, that we're seeing in the industry, and that is um, that these policies are not always applied um, consistently. So, for example, of the six companies that adopted NDP policies since 2017, HSA Group, Nishin, IFCO, BLD, Wings, and Qantas, only four of them had um, also adopted transparency about the supply chain and a grievance list. So six companies have uh, policies that mirror each other, really, but only four of them had sort of adopted the um, policies, you know, the, the sort of work necessary to ensure that those policies were being implemented. And we're seeing this lack of consistency quite a lot. Um, the 10 largest refiners have policies, public supply lists, and grievance lists. The 11th biggest refiner, which is the Saline Group, which um, a lot of people will know as Indofood, um, they have a policy, but they don't have any sort of um, grievance list or public supply list. So again, you're seeing this big inconsistency. And one of the takeaways from this report is that Yes, the industry is doing a lot, it's, it's going in the right direction, but there is um, still a leakage market and there's inconsistency in the application of policies. And one figure that's quite important is that eight of the 25 largest refiners in Indonesia and Malaysia remain part of the leakage market. So you've got 17% of the whole refining capacity not covered by a policy, and that's eight of the 25 largest refiners. So still a significant part of the market is not covered by effective NDP. Um, and yeah, that's sort of an overall of, of what we found in our report, and we'll discuss some of the key issues later, but now I'll pass over to Delisal. Yeah, so thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we'll turn it here now to Annabelle Dodson, a research coordinator at the Zoological Society of London. Annabelle, do you mind telling us a little bit more about the report? Yep, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce Spots um, and I'll go through some of the key findings from our recent report, uh, which is looking at reporting of commitments and implementation on zero deforestation by crushers and refiners assessed on Spot. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
Um, so SPOT is a transparency tool. Um, it assesses commodity producers and traders on the public disclosure of their policies, operations and commitments related to environmental, social and governance issues. Um, SPOT assessments are conducted in-house by the SPOT team using publicly available information against an indicator framework, uh, which for palm oil consists of 180 indicators spread across 10 ESG categories. Um, and these assessments are conducted annually. Um, it's important to note that SPOT assessments um, provide a transparency score and that SPOT does not verify on the ground what the company reports. Uh, but we do, however, provide a media monitor for users to help uh, to monitor disparities with company reporting and what's you know, the reality on the ground. Next slide, please. So our analysis used data from the 2019 spot palm oil assessments and looks at the results of 77 companies that have uh, crushing and or refining facilities. So the companies that we looked at are distributed across the world, but concentrated in Southeast Asia. And the report focuses on indicators relating most directly to three key elements for companies looking to address deforestation risk in their supply chains. So that's uh, zero deforestation policies, traceability and supplier engagement, which are all important for effective implementation of zero deforestation commitments. Next slide, please. So when looking at indicators around zero deforestation, our analysis found that 62% of companies commit to zero deforestation within their own operations, but only 47% uh, of companies make this commitment applicable to all of their suppliers. Um, on top of this, only 38% of companies um, specify in their policies the criteria or types of forest areas um, not to be deforested as well as specify a cutoff date beyond which deforestation or conversion would not be accepted. Uh, we also looked at indicators on identification and protection of HCV and HCS and found that less than 50% of companies make these commitments to their suppliers. Next slide, please. So we also analyzed data around traceability. Um, because understanding where a company sources its palm oil from is an essential component in implementing sustainable sourcing commitments. So we found that only 26% of companies have a time-bound commitment to achieve 100% traceability to plantation level, which is already a fairly lo low number. Um, so on top of that, only 23% of companies have both a commitment to zero deforestation applicable to their suppliers and a time-bound commitment to achieve 100% traceability to plantation level. Um, so that means that actually half of companies with a zero deforestation commitment do not have any uh, time-bound traceability commitment to plantation level, um, and therefore you know, might be unable to verify any claims to having a deforestation-free supply chain. And when we look at the levels of traceability being reported by companies, um, it decreases the further upstream you go, which is to be expected. Um, but although companies with a commitment to achieve 100% traceability are doing much better than those without a commitment, there's still a long way to go as um, even those with a commitment only report an average of 13% traceability from supplier mills to plantation level. Next slide, please. Um, so traceability is, um, of course, only helpful if it's used to drive implementation policies on the ground. So we also looked at indicators around supplier engagement, um, as this is crucial to ensuring that sustainability policy commitments are being met throughout the supply chain. Um, so overall, we found only 6% of companies report having a program to support high risk mills to become compliant with their sourcing policies as well as provide examples of the types of support they provide. And only 6% of companies have a public time-bound plan to engage with all high-risk mills within three years. And a further 3% report that they engage with a subset of their high-risk mills on an annual basis. We found that out of 35 companies which have a sustainability policy in place applicable to all suppliers, only four of these, or 11%, report having a program to support high-risk mills, and only 10 of these report having a procedure to assess all own and third-party supplying palm oil mills for risk level. 
So our analysis shows that many companies are lagging behind when it comes to reporting on commitments and implementation on zero deforestation. Uh, and you know, much more needs to be done in order for companies to reach their targets of eliminating deforestation by 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, and just finally, um, so our report touches on a variety of recommendations for stakeholders. Um, and just to highlight here some of the key recommendations um, for crushers and refiners that we uh, include in the report. So some of these key first steps would be to start by making a time bound zero deforestation commitment, which extends to both their own operations and all of their suppliers. Um, implement traceability commitments to the plantation level. And you know, if these are integrated companies, make spatial data available regarding their own operations to help traceability, um, as well as disclosing sourcing locations. And they should communicate their sourcing policies to suppliers and engage with suppliers on implementation plans where they're found to be non-compliant. Um, and that's it, thank you. Happy to take any questions later. Great, thank you so much. And last but definitely not least, I'll turn it over to Nina Roth, the Director of Responsible Investment at BMO Global Asset Management. So Nina, BMO was highlighted as a case study in the ZSL report. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about how you think about palm oil engagement? Yes, sure. Thanks for having me on. Hello, everyone. I'm Nina. I'm part of the 20 Analyst Strong Responsible Investment Team of BMO Global Asset Management. We are, as you might have figured from the picture here, a Canadian investment manager um, with most of the responsible investment team operating from London in the UK. I personally lead the engagement with financial institutions. I oversee our social engagement and then look at soft commodities related deforestation across the value chain, which obviously also includes palm oil. And we can move on to the next slide. Um, I briefly speak about our rationale for engaging. So first of all, clearly deforestation contributes to approximately 20% of global emissions and through that contributes to climate change. And, and one of its main drivers is, for that is industrial agriculture with the most relevant commodities being soy, dairy, cattle farming and, and palm oil. Palm oil, obviously, and likely everyone on this call is aware, um, it's a core commodity, not only in direct food production, but also with the chemicals industry and cosmetics, and, and more controversially, at least in the EU, um, also part of, of biofuels. Coming from the investor perspective, um, the reason for engaging is that if companies perform better from an environmental, social, and governance perspective, they also um, have returns. This in turn is, is relevant um, for companies as such, of course, but obviously also for making sure they are in a position to pay back their loans, to generate returns for investors, and then this is obviously also relevant um, for most of our pensions. As a team, we do engage um, on palm oil across our equity and fixed income holdings, um, and the results of these engagements also feed into investment decisions. For the engagement, because obviously we have to prioritize and can't engage everyone, um, we picked out companies um, across the value chain with the key role in addressing palm oil related environmental and social concerns and focused on a small set of palm oil growers and refiners, mainly in Malaysia and Indonesia, on consumer goods companies in China, India and Southeast Asia, and then also on banks and in like, uh, like across the world, multinational banks, but then also a specific focus on the ASEAN region and banks operating there. The themes we engage on um, are, and you will see that very similar across um, all the industries um, um, and then have like some specificities. Um, so for palm oil producers, um, we want them to become RSPO members, which obviously is um, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia, often um, in, in the, the medium-sized companies, a, a challenge uh, because they, quote unquote, only want to commit to MSPO or ISPO. Um, we want them to work towards 100% um, certification, ideally RSPO certification, um, we want them to have NDPE policies, um, enhanced transparency, and with that, um, it, it also includes traceability 
But as we've, we've heard earlier, this is obviously a challenge and I can speak about that later in, in the Q&A, for example. For the FM, FMCG companies, um, we uh, focus on sustainable forcing, uh, sourcing standards, um, also RSPO membership and cert certification would be good. This is in the regions that we're focusing on, um, extremely difficult and, and rarely achieved. Um, similarly to having NDP um, policies in place, um, um, so a step in, in all those directions is really to speak about transparency, reporting, um, enhanced disclosure with them and, and work on, on traceability, um, usually as, as a step towards like then general sustainable sourcing standards, etc. For the banks, um, we want them to have a governance framework in, in place, usually um, along a classic environmental and social risk framework, which asks for certain due diligence criteria prior to lending or underwriting. Um, and this like with a specific focus then on palm oil, uh, but also across other soft commodities. Um, we ask for our SPO membership. Um, and well, this is very challenging in the ASEAN region, the multinational ones, it's, um, it's a bit easier, but still um, a challenge. Um, and in the ASEAN region, we also look at um, smallholder lending standards um, because they, they are usually forgotten about. And just um, to, to close, and, and then we can further discuss in the Q&A, some very brief high level observations across all these industries. Um, we see that um, commitments do exist um, towards zero deforestation, but um, the, the progress on implementation is extremely slow. Um, yeah, it's extremely slow. Um, we often hear feedback um, to existing regulatory, or, or feedback um, that references existing regulatory frameworks or requirements they have to um, fulfill and um, bind a lot of resources and capacity internally, which makes it very difficult for them to commit to additional voluntary standards, which like all of what, what I've been talking about is considered to be one. Um, and then like an inter interesting consideration we had received um, um, a couple of times was that um, there were transparency concerns. That's mainly from the FNCG companies. Um, because they thought if they disclose too much, it, it might become a competitive disadvantage, which of course we try to convince them that it could be actually the contrary. That's it from my side. Great, thank you very much. So thank you to all of our panelists. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes now for a panelist discussion before ending with the Q&A. So let's start with Chris. Can you tell us a little bit more about the role that crushers and refiners play in the supply chain and why they're so important? Yeah, sure. I, I touched on this a little bit in the beginning of my presentation, but um, you know, the, the palm oil industry, there's, so, there's thousands of growers, um, predominantly in Indonesia and Malaysia, but you know, globally, um, palm oil is ending, ending up in the supply chains of thousands of manufacturers and consumer goods companies, but there are comparatively few um, people in the midstream that are either refining um, palm oil um, or crushing the early kernel. So if you really want to have an impact, you can target that midsection. And that's, that's really what happened. The, the first sort of um, NDP policy, as we know, it was adopted by Wilma. Um, he's the biggest trader in the world. Um, and because they're um, refining and trading such a huge amount of palm oil, and, and because the NDP policies were applied not just um, to a company's own concessions and own holdings, but to the entire supply chain, that had such a huge knock-on impact. So if you're a grower and you were relying on Wilma um, as your sort of main client, Wilma adopting this policy meant that you really had to um, comply with them and you had to adopt the framework that these policies have, which was, you know, high carbon stock and no peak clearance, no fires. Um, and then what we saw was that because Wim were the biggest, they adopted it and then other refiners started following. And then um, if you were a grower um, at the beginning, maybe you, you know, if you didn't want to comply with NDP, there were other options, um, which we refer to as the leakage markets or the market outside of NDPE. 
Um, but as sort of the years have gone on and um, there's been more um, attention on palm oil sustainability, that leakage market has, has closed. And if you're a grower, there, is, there are far fewer refinery options for you now um, because so much of this midstream section, which deals with um, you know, trays and refines this palm oil, is covered by NDP policies. And then what you saw was that them being adopted by people downstream. You know, the traders were saying, okay, we're, we're doing all this work. And then the downstream sort of um, came on board as well. And it just had such a knock-on impact. Um, we often talk about traders refiners um, as if that covers the whole market. Of course, kernel crushes are slightly separate. Um, often there's overlap, but often they are separate kernel crushing companies. We haven't yet seen um, the same sort of transformation in the kernel crushing sector that we have seen in the CPO um, sector. There's, so there's still a lot to do, but again, because there are comparatively few kernel crushes um, that are producing you know, this product, if you can target that midstream section, you can have such a massive knock-on impact. That makes sense, thank you very much. So Annabelle, I wonder if you could clarify some of the synergies that you found between the two reports and some areas where they differ. Uh, yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so I think there's kind of a few key differences between the reports, even though we found fairly similar results. Um, I think the first one being, um, as Chris already mentioned, that we looked at both crushers and refiners. Um, so, uh, whereas um, Cherry Action Research just looked at the refineries. Um, the main difference, I think, is the geography that we looked at. So, um, with our um, analysis, um, about 40% of companies were based in Indonesia and Malaysia, but really they're spread across the globe. Um, However, uh, Chain Reaction Research's report focused on Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and I think, you know, they found a slightly more positive um, trend than we did. And I think that's probably partly because uh, Indonesia and Malaysia have had a lot more pressure to improve their sustainability practices in the palm oil industry. Um, but when, you know, when we're looking at, at companies that are spread right across the world, um, maybe in some places where there's a lot less sustainability awareness, um, then that makes the results you know, seem a little bit more negative. Um, and, and the other main kind of difference, um, I guess, is the, the scope of the reports and what we looked at. So we focused, um, as I already touched on, uh, zero deforestation policies, traceability and supplier engagement, um, whereas um, the other reports focus more around uh, grievances and, and transparency. Um, I don't know if Chris wants to add anything to that. I think what um, Annabelle said is, is key about Indonesia and Malaysia. There's been a, a huge amount of attention focused on um, those regions and the companies in those regions because they often were the ones that had um, concessions. So we've seen a real transformation in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, it might not be representative of the, of the global system. So if you looked at Indian refineries, you'd have a much lower figure because there isn't the transparency in India that we see in, um, in Indonesia and Malaysia. So and there's sort of like, for me, the two things you can take from that is that actually what's happened in Indonesia and Malaysia has been really um, significant. And the industry, if you compare it to where we were a few years ago, has significantly transformed and traders and refiners are really um, doing a lot you know, to implement policies and try and get deforestation out of their supply chains. And they should be you know, commended for that. Um, there's still a lot of problems in Indonesia and Malaysia. If, if you look at our reports, um, you know, 17% of refining capacity is not covered. Um, there's issues with implementation, but it's, they're doing okay. But if you compare globally, it's not such a good picture. And I think that's where the ZSL report picks up some of these complexities as well, because they're looking in a, a wider scope um, than we did. So sort of positives and negatives that you can take from from you know, the findings that we both came up with. Yeah, that's helpful. And if you haven't already, I definitely encourage all participants to take a look at the reports. They're very insightful. 
So uh, now let's move to uh, BMO. So Nina, in your opinion, how much attention are these issues receiving among financial institutions today? Well, when I look at um, our engagement and then like focusing on, on banks, I, I would say it, it doesn't yet receive enough attention. Um, and, and therefore I just can um, applaud um, the, the efforts uh, here around on the two reports um, and they are highly significant. I think as a concept in general, traceability has been getting at least in the, in the last two, three, four years, uh, significantly more attention. Um, when I look at, at the banks specifically, and um, in, in preparation for today, I, I looked at, at 25 institutions, and the majority of them, 18, um, did have or do have standards in place um, to scrutinize loans um, to the palm oil industry um, for like, particularly having a dedicated palm oil related due diligence, looking at deforestation mainly. Um, and also mainly um, looking at RSPO membership. Um, some of them looking for full certification or a timeline until the full certification is achieved, um, which we know um, is, is, is rare um, anyway. Only seven of these 25 banks are actually uh, directly members of the RSPO. Um, when we look at their deforestation commitments or zero deforestation commitments, the numbers are um, massively lower um, um, to basically non-existing. Um, and so I, I would say um, in, in conclusion, um, full traceability is key to achieving um, zero deforestation, gains more and more attention, uh, but it's very, very far from being achieved and um, banks are not yet fully integrating that in their due diligence frameworks. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. So let's turn to Chris again. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the two-tier leakage markets that was outlined in the chain reaction research report? Yeah, this, this issue of leakage has been one that, that um, CRR and Aid Environment and other organizations have focused on for a while. And we've referred to leakage as the, the um, part of the market that's not covered by NDP policies. So the, the ones that we covered in the report and everyone knows about are sort of geographical markets like India, um, Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, but also specific um, sectors like the domestic Indonesian biofuel sector is now providing a sort of leakage market for companies suspended by traders and by the CPO, um, international CPO market. But what we found as we sort of work and investigate um, trade or refiners a bit more is that you're seeing even within the companies that have NDP policies a lack of consistency in the way that they're applied and this is where the sort of two-tier system comes in within the NDP market as well because the NDP policies largely mirror each other they're, they're sometimes differ in terms of the cutoff date or there's a sp specific component that's slightly different but usually they're the same um, but obviously how they're implemented is going to vary depending on the people in the company, the, the area that you're buying from. And what we're seeing a lot is a company will be, a grower will be suspended by one trader that has an NDP policy, but will still remain in the supply chain of a company, of a buyer that has um, the same NDP policy. Um, and that it's sort of creating this, this two tier system where um, you've got some companies doing a really, really good job and really, you know, have got very, very clean supply chains and they're, you know, doing what NGOs and civil society expects them to do. And then companies with the same policy um, are providing an outlet you know, for the, the market for these growers that have been suspended. And that is really undercutting this sort of movement in the industry. You know, not only do you have this leakage market but you've got a sort of leakage market within the NDP market as well and if you're a refiner that's really really trying it's very difficult to sort of um, try and influence a grower to change you know, to stop work or to implement a compensation program if that grower can find a buyer elsewhere whether it's in India or whether it's in a Malaysian trader with an NDP policy they're just not implementing um, as well as they should be um, 
so we you know we we had a couple of key performance indicators that we use, but it's so much more complex. And I think that's um, one of the things I want to get across that um, some of the figures look great, um, but when you dig into them a little bit deeper, there are these these complexities that, and it shows why there needs to be a more standardised approach. And and really, you're re relying on the entire industry to um, implement their policies because if it's just one or two everything just the whole sort of premise of using the buyer pressure to influence change falls apart because those little bits of the market remain open to suppliers suspended by other parts of the market thank you that's a good point so nino i asked before about uh, the status of the financial uh, sector on these commitments what risks do you see for the financial se sector when there are gaps in deforestation commitments? Well, I mean, the, 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 the core risk is that if financial institutions do not manage like, every environmental, social or governance risk well, um, in, in, they might onboard loans or companies and, and loans and other financial instruments um, that won't um, won't pay out, so um, that that default and that obviously then has um, implications for the bank itself or the investor itself and and um, their returns. And and as I mentioned in my introduction, it has also implications for let's say all our pensions. Um, so apart from really like the pure environmental concerns one can and should have there are the really the financial concerns yeah that makes sense thank you so annabelle do you mind walking us through some of the key recommendations that we can draw from the zsl report i noticed a number of sections on re recommendations throughout um, yeah, if you could go to the next slide, please. We've just put um, some of the key uh, recommendations for financial institutions that we draw on in the report. Um, so um, as a first step, uh, we recommend financial institutions develop a palm oil policy that requires the companies that they're investing in or lending to to commit to implementing NDP policies um, or be 100% RSPO certified. Uh, the policies should provide details as to what is expected of companies and how it will be monitored to ensure compliance. Um, FIs should require companies um, to report on NDP related issues and they should engage with them on defining uh, like time bound plans or implementation of these commitments, including how they'll address any non compliance. Um, and finally, <clears throat> uh, financial institutions should build NDP requirements into their capital allocation due diligence frameworks, um, as well as consider joining investor-led initiatives, such as the PRI, Sustainable Palm Oil in Investor Working Group, uh, which is a good way to increase impact and strengthen alignment on um, financial sector messaging in the palm oil industry. Um, I don't know, Nina, if you want to comment on the you know, how realistic these are or if uh, <laughs> doing any of these. <laughs> Yeah, I have I have a few comments here. Yeah. Um, so maybe we, when when I start at the top, um, so um, like requiring a policy or to have a policy in place um, is like if you lend to a company, it is much easier because you're in a, in a different uh, negotiation position um, um, with the company itself. Um, if you invest, let's say, as an, as an equity investor, um, only in companies that either have a commitment for strict NDP policies in place and or are 100% RSPO certified, your investment universe gets extremely small um, and um, then but basically not workable and, and your um, mission to, to generate any, any returns um, will, will not work out. It might be easier in, um, for a fixed income investment, so a pre-investment engagement basically to, to get a company um, to have such a policy in place um, and, and tell them you would only buy the bond in, in, case, in case they do. For um, the, the, the next one, the, the requirement or well, um, yeah, um, 
to to lend or invest um, um, only in companies that report on NDP related issues. Um, obviously, we engage on, on all types of disclosure and transparency, um, as mentioned before, um, on NDP commitments and related transparency, um, and, and reporting is obviously part of it. As, as mentioned earlier, um, to consider it as a prerequisite for investment, it's very difficult to do, um, given the, the investment universe limitation would result from it. Um, and, and the, the, the low number of companies that actually have it in place. Um, again, it's easier for lending um, and, and um, pre-investment engagement for, for corporate bonds. Then in terms of um, capital allocation um, and col collaborative or collective engagement, um, I, I start with the, the collective um, en engagement um, and um, that's an easy one. Um, well, it's great and necessary. It's a useful tool um, to, to achieve corporate change. Um, and um, we are, like, BMO Global Asset Management is a member um, of the PRI, um, Sustainable Palm Oil Investor Working Group. But honestly, um, the, the PRI has uh, over 3,000 members and quote unquote, only 62 investors are members of the, of the Palm Oil Group. Um, um, so the room um, for more is obviously given. Uh, there's still still space, and we welcome more more members. The tricky part um, is the is the other requirement, um, and I'm not 100 percent sure whether whether it's it's a potentially misleading formulation on on the capital allocation due diligence frameworks. So. When we look at banks, um, what they can do more is obviously incorporating sustainability risks and, and opportunities at the same time, including deforestation or labor rights issues, that's both more on the risk side actually, in their country and industry capital allocation considerations. Um, but you have to see that this will only be one aspect of many uh, and therefore the likelihood of having a significant impact is limited. If instead you mean, and that's for investors, um, that they have due diligence frameworks in place that assess all holdings or all, all companies um, they are planning to invest in for their ESG risks, um, or in, in this um, regard, um, well, deforestation or yeah, um, exploitation related risks, um, then yes, I think this is something that um, some investors do have in place already some quote unquote only for their responsible, sustainable or ESG screened investments, uh, but probably that should be uh, much broader um, a, a, across all industries um, and across all holdings and products. Um, so that it, it's a good demand. Um, it's just tricky regarding the, the formulation. Thank you. And just as a quick follow up there, Nina, do you have any specific recommendations on uh, how financial institutions can further mitigate deforestation risk? Well, we, we really engage on um, companies, A, um, coming up with zero deforestation commitments. Um, it's very difficult to, to implement and we acknowledge that, uh, but they can do that by risk mapping the, the commodities or sectors they are lending to um, and, and understand which areas they need to um, approach most. So which commodity, for example, and if it's palm oil, what type of um, requirements they, they, can, they can ask um, the, the companies they are lending to or underwriting. Um, um, for. And so, um, yes, it's an enhanced environmental and social risk due diligence framework um, across all uh, financial instruments um, and across all jurisdictions, and that, that's necessary to implement. Great. Thank you for, uh, from, to all of our panelists today. Uh, before we start with the q and I just want to give a quick opportunity to each panelist to highlight some of the key takeaways for our participants listening today. So let's start with Chris. Um, yeah, I think a key takeaway from our assessment is that there has been significant development um, and we're moving in the right direction, um, but it, it's, there's still huge challenges and um, 
that we need to be really wary of and particularly with these leakage markets that still remain and um, particularly biofuels that's something that we're really really going to see develop in the next few years um, where um, Indonesia and Malaysia encourage the domestic biofuel market and a lot of the trader refiners or growers that have been suspended from traditional markets or had been um, changing suddenly find a market that doesn't really have any um, sustainability requirements. So we need to be really vigilant and keep the pressure on and the industry needs to work together to sort of keep these, shrink these leakage markets. Definitely. Annabelle? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, similar to, to Chris, um, you know, from the analysis, it seems a lot more needs to be done um, by these companies. And I think focusing on, on these, you know, this area of the supply chain as a bottleneck is really important and something that we should all try and put more pressure on uh, going forward in order to help companies achieve these zero deforestation uh, targets. Right, absolutely. And Nina, any last takeaways? Um, I would agree that we move um, into the right direction, but much, much, much too slow. And I think it needs an effort across um, all industries, um, across various stakeholder groups. Um, and there, there is a lot of room for collaboration. Yes, definitely. So we'll move on now to a Q&A. So we have all of our panelists available for questions. We've already seen a ton of questions come in. And we also have Eleanor Spencer from ZSL. Uh, with us answering questions too. So to start, uh, what is the best implementation system or approach for traders and refiners to cascade the commitments further upstream? So this uh, likely applies mostly to uh, CRR and ZSL, uh, maybe Annabelle and Eleanor, if you'd like to start. Uh, sure, I'm happy to, to jump in on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is partly why um, in, in when we're looking at these indicators through SPOT, we're not being uh, too kind of prescriptive on exactly how companies implement their commitments because we recognise that different parts of the supply chain and different companies um, will have to approach their own supply chains quite differently. Um, so we really uh, kind of emphasise the importance of transparency and reporting on how um, as a trader or a final or other uh, company in the supply chain you're implementing these commitments so that um, others can can learn from best practice um, I mean obviously if, as we've highlighted through the results having that traceability down through the supply chain is a key first step to know who you need to engage with on zero deforestation and, and on your NDP commitments more broadly um, and then having that strong supplier engagement in place uh, is the next kind of key step there. Um, so, you know, having strong relationships with suppliers, knowing who your suppliers are, having a really clear set of asks through your policy um, and clear kind of metrics for following up on that and, and monitoring that through the supply chain, I'd say are all key steps. Um, I think a difficulty in, at that level of the supply chain is often that you have a, a trader or a final who have so many suppliers um, to engage with that it's, it's not necessarily an immediate thing you can fix, um, but certainly kind of starting on that, uh, that journey to, to start engaging with all suppliers and, and making those asks clear, I think is, is really important. And if it's actually a level where it's not possible to engage with all of them, then I, I think um, that's something that uh, that company would need to, to really consider if, if you're not able to engage with all your suppliers, whether that's the right kind of model to be using. Those would be my immediate thoughts, but you know, Annabelle, feel free to add anything else. Um, no, I think you've covered it well. Thank you. I would also just say on, on this, um, there is framework in the industry. I mean, we, the industry has accepted high carbon stock methodology, high conservation forests. There's there's no peat um, policies in, in within the um, NDP policies, and we have you know, pretty reliable peat layers. So it's really um, following the, the your policies or the policies of the trader refiners and being consistent about implementation. Um, because and that that goes for every single company because if you if every company is actually consistently implementing their policy 
the combined weight of those companies can have, can affect real change upstream and the sort of leakage options for a grower are very very small but what we see is they're not implemented consistently and that just allows you know one buyer might just say oh okay i think they've done enough whereas another one hasn't um and then i think the some of the sort of methodology that's being discussed at the moment which is about re-entry or um compensation and um for previous deforestation those there's been like a lot of discussion about them but nothing concrete so we need to have sort of robust um you know procedures and policies for the next stage of the of the discussion and consistent implementation of the policies that do exist thank you very much so the next question is, are there any commonalities among the holdout refiners that do not have NDP policies? So this could include anything from specific leakage markets to ownership structures to reliance on national versus international finance. Um, yeah, I can take this. Um, it's The leakage market is quite difficult to analyze because there's not a lot of transparency about it but the one that really um, stands out is the biofuel sector we know quite a lot about the biofuel sector because in indonesia the suppliers to the biofuel industry particularly the government company pertamina are made public and we know from government data that three of the biggest refiners in refining groups in indonesia best group darmex um, and tunis Lampung are supplying to um, the domestic biofuel market. Um, we know that when you look at capacity, Darmex is almost all of their palm oil is going to biofuel. And Tunis Baralampung, you know, a notoriously bad deforester that has been suspended by everybody in the NDP market, is now expanding, moving into building another biofuel um, factory refinery because there's a market for them. In there so um, there will always be at geographic markets but the one that we have the most data for is biofuel and that's why you know there's so much discussion now about how we can um, encourage some sort of sustainability criteria to be adopted by the Indonesian and Malaysian governments because biofuel is creating such a big leakage market for these companies that have been suspended by um, other sectors. Great thank you. The next question is, what are the buyers doing or what are they prepared to do to encourage crushers and mills to more strictly monitor and report on the implementation of their NDPE commitment? Um, I don't know, does Elisa want to take this with the Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there's a lot more that can be done. A lot of these kind of downstream uh, buyers are putting NDP commitments in place. Um, but, you know, as we've already said, kind of without that traceability um, level, uh, you know, you can't verify that these commitments are being met. Um, I think that, um, you know, doing some more mapping of where companies are buying to kind of help with this traceability would be helpful as well to, to help these downstream buyers um, to improve and engage with their supply chain. Um, I don't know if Ellie wants to add anything to that. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends um, which buyers we're talking about in the supply chain a bit. Um, refiners of, as buyers from crushes. Um, we've obviously looked at a bit through this report and, and can kind of show that not enough is being done there. I think um, further downstream, we're definitely seeing uh, more and more attention to suppliers from the big CGMs and retailers and to how they can monitor their NDP commitments there. Um, I think increasingly um, some those downstream buyers are, are taking a more kind of facility level approach um, looking at kind of particular specific sourcing from particular refineries for example um, and whether those are meeting their commitments and, and that kind of um, targeted engagement and uh, for example refusing to buy from those that are not meeting their, um, their supplier policies I think is a, a kind of good step forward and something that we're starting to see more of. 
Yeah, and just one thing that I can add about the kernel crushes particularly is that it's um, in, it, from an Indonesia and Malaysia context, it's been a part of the industry that has been really difficult to um, bring a bit of some sustainability, um, transparency to, sorry, because it, it's often, I mean, it, it is a bit of a byproduct, the kernel, and a lot of the people that, that are in the kernel crushing market are sort of mid-level um, local companies that are not not really included in the sustainability discussion um we don't really you know are also serving a domestic market and just haven't really been willing or able or, you know to to be involved in the discussion and i think that's just because there's so much demand for kernel and there are so many opportunities for them to buy from whoever has has kernel um so it, it, it's going to take a really sort of targeted approach and i know that there is now a discussion in the industry about how we can sort of apply what's happened in the CPO market to the kernels because a lot of the times when palm oil buyers are getting targeted by NGOs it's because of deforesters coming into their supply chains indirectly and I, and I know from my discussions with them that they often come in via the kernel crushes. So um, I don't think we really have the answers yet but there's going to have to be quite a targeted approach and a real effort to bring some of these mid-level local small companies into the discussion and really get the whole industry to sort of apply pressure because I know that a lot of a lot of the industry is being affected by um, these kind of crushes that have just stayed outside of the sustainability discourse. That makes sense. Thank you. So we've gotten a couple of questions on uh, RSPO engagement. So uh, for Nina, when engaging with the fast moving consumer goods companies on RSPO, do you engage with them to increase purchases of RSPO certified palm oil? To be honest, um, a lot of them don't buy um, certified uh, raw material um, yet at all. Um, so we um, at first try to get them to have sustainable procurement standards and um, as part of that um, in increase by, like, bit by bit um, buying um, certified um, raw materials and um, as, as that it would also be RSPO certified palm oil yes but um, after one and a half years um, where we've been focusing on FMCG companies um, in, in ASEAN um, the progress has been extremely slow and we started at a very low level. Thank you very much. So the next question uh, looks at resources required for implementing sustainability policies. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how some of the actors in the industry are supporting some of the more frontline producers in implementing sustainability policies and applying uh, pressure directly? Um, maybe this would be, we can start with at ZSL. Um, yeah, so um, as part of, of SPOT, I think as Ellie already touched on, we don't kind of define, you know, how companies should do things. Um, we let them define that themselves and we're just looking around, um, you know, the transparency of their reporting, if they're doing something, not necessarily how they do it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if Ellie wants to add anything to that. I'm not... I'm not um, well, may, yeah, maybe uh, the Chain Reaction Research Report delved into uh, a number of financials uh, during the analysis. Chris, would you have any insight on that one? Um, yeah, I mean, this issue of shared responsibility has become you know, a really big point of discussion. It was the theme of the RSPO conference in Bangkok last year. Um, and I think there's an acceptance now that we can't just expect the growers to do everything. Um, also, we can't expect just the refiners and traders to do everything. It has to be the entire supply chain. And that brings into question the role of the consumer goods companies and the manufacturers. Um, you know, if, if we want to encourage growers to adopt um, stockwork orders or do HTS assessments, they cost money. If we want them to compensate for um, stuff that's happened previously, then it needs to be the entire supply chain that, that sort of helps out with that. Um, so there's very much a discussion at the moment about if, if a grower is expected to compensate for all the deforestation that they have um, 
been responsible for over the last few years or adopt a particular policy, then what role does the um, trader have? What role does the consumer goods company have? Is there a role for financial institutions to be in that, um, to be involved in that? Um, so it's difficult, you know, these are discussions that are um, taking place. They take place slowly, which is quite frustrating, but I think it's good now that there has just been a dis an acceptance and acknowledgement that the entire supply chain has to sort of be responsible for, for deforestation that has taken place in, in their supply chain. It isn't just the, um, the grower that's responsible for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And both reports made major strides in uh, this analysis as well. So thank you to all the participants for all your time answering questions, for all of the questions that were submitted. Apologies that we couldn't get through all of them, but you see the emails on the page here for all of the panelists that were joining us today. Um, so we really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to join in this discussion. We hope you're staying safe and healthy and we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. Have a great day.